and Welcome to the Game Case, a show for, well, anyone that plays World of Warcraft. The show rife with ramblings, tips, tricks, and goings on in WoW. Here's your host, Chris Case. Well, hello, hi, howdy, and welcome to episode 34 of the Game Case. I am Chris, also known as Cuddles, a brewmaster monk on Airy Peak in the Convert to Raid Guild. This week, we'll talk a little bit about our week in Blizzard Gaming, some of the Blizzard news that's come out, and we'll dive into a little bit of what it's like to be a content creator. Because this week, I am honored to be joined by one of the hardest working podcasters, not just in the Blizzard world, but even beyond. A man that has been a mentor, a role model, and I am proud to say a friend, the inestimable Mick Montgomery. Mick, how are you doing tonight? I'm a bit overwhelmed by the introduction. That's, uh, that's, that, is, uh, that is more than I believe I'm worthy of, but I do appreciate all the sentiment uh, and kind thoughts. But yeah, I'm, I'm doing well tonight, uh, Thursday night, which is uh, always an interesting night for me to do any kind of podcasting because it's not my usual podcast rotation night, of course, but uh, always glad to jump on. It's been something we've talked about for a long time for me to jump on the game case and uh, join you, so I'm glad that we were finally able to do it. Right on. Well, yeah, thank you for coming out. I, I really appreciate it. I know it's early for you. And like you said, it's an off night. So so thank you very, very much. But with your very full schedule, how has your week been so far? Uh, so far, this has been a very uh, low week uh, coming off of two really big, I think, Blizzard gaming weeks of, uh, you know, uh, I think we kind of went from like BlizzCon to uh, then there was talk of Overwatch uh, uh, stress test weekend and that happened and then right after that the alpha launch for World of Warcraft uh, for Legion so got into that a little bit got back into Heroes of the Storm of course and, and just kind of played a lot of, of Blizzard games all at once uh, even jumped in and started doing a little bit of Starcraft trying to finish off a few missions to get myself ready for uh, Legacy of the Void um, so there was a lot of Blizzard gaming and then this week I've, I've been down and out for most of this week with a little bit of the flu but uh, glad to say I think I'm bouncing back. So I haven't been gaming that much this week, uh, but tonight and tomorrow night I should be back in the action doing some uh, doing some work in the Nexus, getting my Jim Rayner leveled up to Master Skin, and then tomorrow night probably going to be streaming the latest build of the World of Warcraft Legion Alpha for sure. Right on. So it sounds, it sounds like despite being sick, you've been a busy guy. Yeah, well, I, you know, I try to, to stay busy um, as much as I can. Um I think, you know, as we'll talk about later on the show, you know, p content creating is, is a big passion of mine and, and I'm not one to really sit still very often. So I try to every every available minute that I have where I'm not, um, you know, trying to enjoy time with my family or I'm, I'm have my you know daily obligations. I try and fill with making stuff and creating stuff. And right now, a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that you do. Uh, a lot of work that a lot of us do is centered around playing these games and being a part of this community. And so, um, yeah, it's it's about uh, kind of embracing that and, and making sure you're participating and and doing all the good stuff. And when you have as many shows as I do, you got to stay up to par with what's going on. Right on. Right on. Well, for me, I've been uh, I've been doing a little bit of WoW rating. I, uh, I missed my... Now, are you still doing two teams, or are you down to one team? I'm still on two teams. Okay. Uh, one one night a week with the uh, Rubber Chicken Coalition, who I actually missed this week, so sorry, chickens. Um, I was, like you, I was down with a little bit of a bug. Um, I think last night and the night before, I got home from work, fell into bed fully clothed, and then woke <laughs> up the next morning to shower, yeah. put on different clothes, and then go yes. right back to work. Yeah. Um, but I'm back at it now. Uh, got to get in a lot of Hearthstone, um, kind of laying in bed and at work. I don't play Hearthstone at work. We won't talk about oh, that. Oh, nobody does. Nobody. But does. if I nobody, did, you, you don't take you don't take I, Hearthstone I bathroom breaks, do you? That never happens, right? No, no. I generally don't even bother going to the bathroom. Um, yeah. Well, I. Anyway, um, I'm also doing a lot of hots. Um, a lot of the converted crew and a lot of CTR folks are really diving into hots right now. So enjoying mm -hmm. that, enjoying some of the new maps, the the new heroes. I'm buying a lot of heroes. Thank you, Sale. Um, <laughs> rip my wallet. Yeah. Yep. But a lot of new heroes for me and just really having a whole lot of fun. What's, what are some of the heroes that you picked up that you're excited about? <sighs> so it's funny. I, I picked up quite a few and I have yet to play a hero that I dislike. I, I'm loving oh, that's great. Sonya. I'm loving Tassadar. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Vala has been super fun. Um, My old staple is Murky. I've been playing a lot of him. Mm -hmm. Um, And Falstad has been a lot of fun. Just it, it, everything that I played, I got the new, the, well, I say the new, I got the Lurka, Lurka Boo, Lurka Bo Diablo skin, the weird blue Cabolo, and green. Mercabolo, yeah. Th- there I you go. Saying. I got the, I got the big weird crazy Diablo skin and I've been wrecking mm-hmm. face with Diablo. It's, uh, it's just been a whole lot of fun. I'm really, really enjoying getting into heroes and finding some friends that are playing with me. Is that's, that's always been a challenge. A lot of these games, yeah, yeah. heroes and Overwatch especially, Super fun, great games, whole lot more fun when you have a group of friends playing with you. Right, and I think that's the telltale kind of message for all Blizzard games. Like you can you can talk about all the rules, like you know, gameplay first, story second, you know, all those kind of rules that Blizzard has. But the reality is, is that Blizzard does a really good job of of creating games that are fun to play when you incorporate your friends into that gameplay. Even a game like Diablo is more fun when you're playing with your friends. Even a game like Hearthstone is more fun when you're playing against your friends. So it's it's it's, that, it's that's the kind of the way I think it all kind of works out with Blizzard. And that's why we're seeing this kind of shift from, you know, people who are Blizzard fans really for the majority of the last decade or so. If you said, you know, I like playing Blizzard game, which what that really meant was you like playing World of Warcraft for most people. Um, and now what we're seeing is the ability for Blizzard to shift to that core community uh, into their other properties and their other games. And therefore, now when you log in and your guildies are all... Pl- and a lot of this is due to the, the advent of Battle.net, which is actually really kind of a semi-new thing. So once that kind of came online, then you jump in, you're like, okay, well, I'm playing Hearthstone. All right, I'm kind of getting bored with Hearthstone. Oh, I've got some buddies who are playing Heroes of the Storm. Let's go play Heroes of the Storm. Oh, great. Oh, I saw another buddy of mine who just jumped in. Wow, and he and I have been talking about doing a dungeon. I'm going to jump over there and see if we can do a dungeon together. So they've kind of created this really good platform for them to create these social experiences which are really valuable to people probably that is more valuable than the gameplay itself and i think that that's exactly what you're talking about when you can find that opportunity to play with friends and with heroes finally live and real after being an alpha and beta for so long you know now you're seeing more and more people that you can play with on a daily basis oh yeah and that's that's exactly i think i i want to say it was you that i heard talking about the term blizzard gamer being, yeah. being bandied about for the very first time officially. And that's that's really what it's become. Exactly what you're describing. That was my day today. Yeah. I, yeah. I was I was playing Hearthstone and somebody was like, hey, come do some mythic dungeons. So I went and did a couple mythic dungeons, which by mm-hmm. the way, I was the lowest item level in there. Everyone was six like thirty plus. Oh my gosh, the bosses melted. It was glorious. Mm-hmm. I'm only going with Mythic Raiders from now on. <laughs> um, and I would also be utterly remiss if I did it because Draven Dresden is in the chat room right now. I did get some Diablo in himself mm-hmm. and Kalani uh, helped me power level my seasonal tune mm-hmm. from 19 all the way up to Paragon level 25 in an evening. And oh my wow. gosh, was wow. that fun. And I thought yeah. just like I thought that I was enjoying Diablo. And then I started playing with friends and I realized how much fun Diablo really was. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's Blizzard is doing a great job right now. Yeah. So mm-hmm. kudos to Blizz. Yeah, they, they've they found a magic formula. And, and when they play into it, you know, the other night or a couple of weekends ago, you got into the Overwatch stress test weekend, right? Yes, sir. Right. So that was a weekend where I, you know, I felt everyone just rushed to go play some overwatch i had so many people asking if i could come join games i didn't have enough time to play with all the folks who are asking to play games with me you know and that's i think that speaks to how strong the community is for for what blizzard is doing and i know a lot of people and a lot probably a lot of folks who listen to this particular podcast where games outside of blizzard's kind of purview really aren't a part of their their kind of their day-to-day gaming lifestyle. If they're a gamer, if they play games, um, there's a lot of folks who are becoming just legitimately, strictly Blizzard-oriented gamers. They're not playing consoles. They're not going out there to play the latest, you know, PC game. You know, Witcher 3 might be something that attracts somebody away for maybe a couple of nights, but at the end of the day, they're back playing WoW, you know, a couple nights later. So that speaks to, you know, the magic that Blizzard has that's kind of underrated, I think, in the industry when the industry is so focused on AAA releases and get big games out there and get people to play those games and buy, 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 and pre-sell, pre-sell, pre-sell. 
Whereas Blizzard's kind of like, we're we're making, has a completely different strategy of, we're making a game that's going to last for a long time. People are going to play it for a long time. That's our goal. And it's unique. And I think it's why they have the community that they have. I think it's why they get coverage out of companies like Nerdist uh, the way that they do. Because, you know, Nerdist covers Blizzard's completely different from other video game content that they do and does a lot more. And there's a reason for that. Oh, yeah. And that's... It's funny that you mentioned how people kind of approach it because I, I come from a console gaming background mm -hmm. and that, that was me forever until about a year ago. And if you had told me a year ago that I would be happy with one menu with, what is it, six games now? Five because yeah. I'm not yeah. still in the Overwatch beta. Mm -hmm. um, if you had told me that I would be happy logging in every day and playing five games, I would have called you crazy. I have, I have literally behind me, I have a cabinet full of Xbox One and 360 games yeah, yeah. because you're swapping games out and you're, oh no, this new game, new Call of Duty's out in three months. Got to go play yeah, it. It's exactly. Exactly. And I was in that same boat too. You know, for a long time, I was a big, you know, console guy and strictly played console games. And you, li you live in this weird lifestyle when you're not a weird lifestyle, but the lifestyle I think of a console gamer is what's the newest release this week or what's coming up this month. And you kind of look at it and, you know, you go through the, should I pre-order it? Should I not pre-order it? What should I do? Should, okay. I'm going to pre-order it. Uh, and this is something I'm going to try and target for rental off of my Gamefly account or, or that kind of stuff, you know. And so you're, you're constantly buying and cycling through games. And at that point, what happened to me and I think what happens to a lot of players is the games have become almost disposable. And I got to a point with my play where I just kind of felt like I'm literally doing the same thing. It's just a different flavor over and over again. I need something that offers me more something more. And what I found that more to be was the community connection within the game. When I started playing World of Warcraft for the first time in 2008, it was a different, it was a different mentality completely about what was going on. The game was more about where are you as my friend? How can I get to you? How can we play together versus log on, play five or six, you know, POV, uh, PVP matches and Call of Duty and call it a night. Definitely. Definitely. And it's, it's, I think that was one of the first things that I realized when I, when I first got invited into, um, into CTR was the, the community and that feeling of, I don't know, family and being at home and, and just, it's it, like you said, there's, I got the same people in Heroes and Hearthstone and everywhere. It's, it's beautiful. Um, it, it really is. So, so why don't we slide on over into um, a little bit of, of Blizzard news. And now for news from All Things Blizzard. All right, so guys, there is a whole lot of news out. Mick and I touched on this in before we went live. And uh, we're not going to touch on everything that's going on in Legion Alpha right now. Brand new release just came out last night, went live. I have not had a chance to touch it. Mick, I, have you gotten to touch it yet? Uh, I haven't touched the new build yet. I have. I did jump in when the alpha first launched and played the Demon Hunter through a couple of times. So I'm anxious to get in there and start, you know, <laughs> getting some progression through. I know my co-host from the Starting Zone Alt has been in there all day long today, um, you know, posting pictures and, and, and basically live tweeting her experience going through uh, going through uh, Broken Isles and what she's been doing. So I, I think uh, from all I'm hearing right now is lots of good things. Um, and obviously folks stumbling upon weird bugs and things that aren't completely built yet. Uh, but at the same time, I'm seeing a, a high level of excitement for sure in and around this alpha. And I think that's because, and I, I mean, Chris, what about you? Have you jumped into the alpha at all yet? Yes, I've actually, I've leveled three Demon Hunters all to, uh, all to like, as far as you can go, half, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All up to the spoiler alert, up to where you're gonna go back to the uh, what is it, the Black Citadel? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. right, yeah, right before you get you get up to the portal. And funny story on that, so you get done, you're on the little you're on the little island kind of thing, and that I got there, got done the very first time, and then walked over to the edge, and I was like, oh, where's the flight point? I can't fly back. What am I gonna do? Mm hmm. You're and, gonna log out and roll a new tune. That's what you're gonna do. <laughs> no, then I figured out that demon hunters can fly, which I knew the whole time. You have wings, so I was able to glide yes, back yes. down and then go around and play around and level a little bit more. But no, I have not touched the new one. I, 
No, have you have you seen any of the stuff that's out? Is there any is there any one big thing that you're excited to get to when you do get to pop it open? I, I think for me, it's going to be checking out the class halls and the artifact weapons a little bit. Um, some of the folks today that I've been watching uh, in passing as I've had a spare minute or two have been kind of progressing through the artifact weapons for different classes. And time and again, what I hear is this is awesome and this is great. And I really enjoy this part of what they've introduced. So I think that's a good thing. You know, how does that age, Allah, how does Garrison's age is a thing. Um, but at the same time, we're already seeing talk of, you know, uh, Blizzard Watch has a couple of posts up already about how this might be a clue of what progression looks like beyond 110 uh, for your artifact weapons. So, you know, I think that for the most part, I think that's what I'm most excited to get into and see. I'm always interested in what that new thing is that Blizzard puts out for us to do, uh, which they really started introducing really kind of uh, when they started with pet battles, right? It's like, here's a new game feature that's completely different and completely new, and we're putting it into the game. We want you to try and play it out. Um, and then that moved on to something more, more robust for Warlords with Garrisons. So I'm always interested when they say, you know, here's something that we're putting into the game that's completely new. No one's ever done it before, but we think it's going to be great. And Artifact Weapons to me is is a big part of that. And how that kind of melds or doesn't melds with the class orders, uh, class order halls is really cool. So I'm looking at roll, I'm looking forward to rolling a new paladin and kind of getting in there and seeing how those mechanics kind of work and 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 get an early feel for Legion. Uh, this is a expansion for me that couldn't come out any you know couldn't come out sooner. So right on, right on. I I think I feel the same way. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it to be live. <laughs> My body but, is ready. <laughs> although like. Th thank you to whichever whichever person it was at Blizzard that decided to check the little tick box next to my name and get me into the alpha. Like I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of it and be mm -hmm. able to see it from this side. Like it's 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 yeah. so cool. Yeah, and what a fundamentally weird and arcane process beta access, alpha access is uh, for Blizzard. You know, there are so many people that have their theories, but yet none of us know really how it works. I mean, you know, I, I've had friends that were just so stoked about getting into the WoW beta uh, and then not so stoked about getting into Overwatch, got into Overwatch, but not into the WoW beta and vice versa. You know, yep. <laughs> it's kind of, it's it's almost this kind of interesting, uh, you kind of get what you don't want, but yet what you got is pretty cool. There's that kind of thing that's happening there's people who aren't getting in as much as fast as they want to so you know i'm also very conscious too of having access to the games early is is a bit of a privilege and, and trying to look at play the game and do stuff without you know throwing it in people's faces and, and kind of making people feel just a little bit verklempt that they can't participate as well so that's always a fun phenomenon that you got to balance out when you get access to these games oh yeah and it's definitely there's a there's a responsibility inherent in it too like i i know Bug reports aren't normally something that I would fill out, and I find myself leaving mm -hmm. detailed notes now, yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, th that's that's what we're there to do. Like, yeah, we're there to have fun and be able to say stuff on podcasts and tweet about things and take cool pictures, standing in Mardoon with our demon hunters and make them our Twitter banner, and that's the yeah. that's where my bragging will e will end. Mm -hmm. oh, just yeah. my Twitter banner because it's awesome. But you know, the thing that's really cool too about the, what we're seeing is just how terrific the world looks that they're creating in legion you know i'm not to say that warlords wasn't a great you know draenor itself wasn't a great zone right yeah. but the, the as i've said before uh the the demon hunter starting zone is is a whole new level of creativity in my mind just from an artistic direction standpoint and if we're getting to see this kind of very large epic quality uh in and around all these zones which i'm anxious to see if we do get uh, when we go into some of the other zones of the broken isles uh, Blizzard's really on to, has really rediscovered, I think, somehow how to make this game feel epic again. So, Oh, yeah. Now, moving on from Alpha, Hearthstone Tavern Brawl is up. It was uh, it was a little bit delayed. I don't, I don't know how much you Hearthstone. Have you dove in? Have you got to do the uh, Tavern Brawl yet? So here's the deal. Hearthstone and I were good, fast friends for a very long time. And I got to about the Nax Ramus adventure... Okay. And I stalled out right about there. So it's been a while for me in Hearthstone, even though I do jump in from time to time, even though I roll out my my druid, uh, my arcane druid uh, deck every once in a while and still pwn face on the ladder. Um, I still haven't jumped into any of the new features at all yet. I just haven't had a chance to get in there. And and I'm, I don't know, you've been playing pretty regularly in terms of Hearthstone. I just kind of starting to feel like it's 
it slipped past me. Like I'm I'm too far behind now. Well, that's what I'm I'm just getting into it. And I guess I've never had the feeling that I was on top of it. I could definitely see how somebody could be like, well, I was on top of it. And then I took a break for a few months. and All these cards came out and I'm out of the meta. And for me, I'm just, pfft, I'm out of the meta. Like, I I, I don't have any cards. I'm, I'm totally no. comfortable with this. <laughs> I, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. So, and I think that that's the, hard, that's the thing with that game that's interesting is that you you kind of can get you can get roped too much into the meta game, I think, as a player, and then probably do what I've done, which is intimidate myself out of just going in there and having a good time. Um, versus heroes, where the meta is so fluid at this point, um, there's really no meta anymore in heroes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying because you know I think you yourself and then another guy from Spazbot Studios, Chris Allman, are just kind of just getting into Hearthstone for the first time and really having a good time. So I think. The appeal for new players is definitely there. It's it's. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at it, going, "Oh man, do I have enough cards? Am I going to get back into this again? Where I'm, you know, grinding out dailies to dust cards to make that legendary? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we all know what that feels like. So oh. you know, it, it's uh, it's hard when I could also go, mm, "Here's the storm. Let's go do that for a little while." <laughs> well, that's the thing. I haven't even figured out what dusting. Like I, I understand what the term means. I haven't done it to any cards yet. I, I haven't even touched it. Um, but this week there is a tavern brawl called Dex Assemble. This one, this one is so much fun. So you get you get like three, four cards, and then as you play them, you put a copy of it into your deck, and you also get three cards to discover from, and mm-hmm. that will go in your deck regardless of whether or not you play it. And you may, and at the end of your turn, all your cards go back in the deck, reshuffle, and then you draw four more cards. So for me, not having a whole lot of cards, Arena and Tavern Brawl oh, has yeah. been my friend. Yeah. I'm getting to see yeah. some of the cards. I'm getting to see how they interact. And it, it's allowing me to kind of become a better player without actually spending hundreds of dollars or hours and hours. Like you said, grinding and, and dusting. and, and uh, the- Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that when you're starting, at least if my, if my Hearthstone memory serves me, um, when you're starting up, you know, playing a lot of arena is a good idea, you know, because you're going to get the experience. You're going to get to understand the fluidity of deck builds and how cards work together by experimentation. And, you know, you're going to get something out of your time in there. Right. So I think you're doing the right thing by playing arena because you're going to learn a lot doing that that way. And you're also going to start to build up your deck that way. Oh yeah. Now we, now we touched a little bit earlier on how people are getting a little bit salty that they're in the wrong beta mm-hmm. or they're not in the beta. Um, and what we saw a little bit earlier today is even the folks that are in one of the betas are actually getting a little bit salty about some news that came out a little earlier. And that is the Overwatch beta. <laughs> yeah, um, Blizzard Blizzard managed to piss off a bunch of people today with that, yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen our... our our very own good friend and one of your co-hosts, uh, Mr. Notch, is is a little bit salty this evening over on his Twitch stream. Yeah, of course he is. Um, <laughs> and I don't blame him because, you know, he's, he's you know, embraced Overwatch as a game that he really likes. You know, my co-host, um, a, a Notch from Another Notch Gaming over on Twitch, um, you know, he obviously embraced heroes very much. He's embracing overwatch because he was a competitive, you know, esports professional, uh, first person, halo, uh, shooter, halo player for a long time. So oh. a shooter for him is like an old warm, you know, chair that he is going to slide into and, and, and enjoy. And he loves overwatch and, and overwatch is a strong game. I think this is a really interesting step because blizzard, <clears throat> blizzard really hasn't done something this drastic with any sort of, beta or alpha or anything before i i can't remember in all the times and i've been doing beta testing for a long time where they have said hey we're going to take this down for over a month and i've never seen that before and so it's it's definitely very new i'm kind of curious to see how much data and what they've collected and because my concern i don't know about your concern but my concern was that there's some fundamental map structure issues uh, with what they presented at the stress test weekend that I thought this isn't going to play out well opening weekend. You know, to me, the first week of that game launching, players are going to buy this and be pissed that they bought this game because they can't get out of, you know, if they're in a, 
if they're in a payload match, they're not going to be able to get out of their starting bin and they're not going to be able to move the payload and folks are going to get frustrated. And, and I was concerned about that. So I'm wondering, and that was voiced a lot by some other community members as well. So I'm wondering if that may be one of the things that they're kind of going back and saying, we need to do some more kind of retooling of our gameplay and introduce something else uh, before we start to really push hard in the spring to refine the game so that it can be launch worthy uh, either by April or May. Well, that's what, along with the map issues, I've heard a lot about uh, character balancing in not not even what we think of when we think character balancing that, as in heroes, like, you know, oh, we need to nerf this or nerf that, but just basic fundamentals of how a character's uh, tracer, for example, her mm -hmm. health pool being a little high versus her maneuverability and her weapons output. And yeah. yeah, those are all little things that you can tweak, but then when you take tweaking all three of them at the same time, Mm -hmm. along with other heroes balancing and they've said they're going to rework bastion and totally change the way that he plays like I, sure what like what well, is he going to be able to move uh, um yeah i mean that but this would be the second big rework for bastion too so okay um if you look at the build from bastion in 2014 that uh, blizzard had for him his his um ultimate was completely different from what it is today so uh, that doesn't surprise me that they're going in that direction um, because I think what was starting to happen was there's just strategies that were a little too cheese. There's too much cheese happening. That's just my impression. That's my impression. I, I and, know I went up against a team of six Mays, mm -hmm. and we tried everything. We yeah, what are you going to do, do about five ice block walls, you know, when you're trying to push or, your payload to the yeah. end? You, you, there's nothing you could do there. And it was the same thing with Bastion. It's like, okay, we're trying to push this payload, but there's four Bastion turrets back there. What are we supposed to do with this in a map that's very tight? Um, you know, like the, um, what's the UK spinoff map called that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so when you have these kind of, I wouldn't say fundamental flaws, but um, exploits that are happening, I, Blizzard kind of has to stop and go, well, how do we do this? And balancing the heroes is the number one way. But boy, that data has got to be scrambled as hell when you have people shifting so many heroes within the course of a map. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know, and they, like how do you how do you memorize? Like how do you how do you figure out when someone switched their their hero seven times in a match? Like how do you understand what the win rate is for a particular hero to see if they're out of balance in the first place? You know, that's, yeah. How do you how do you understand the win rate of of Torbjorn when somebody played him for thirty eight seconds in a match that they played Reaper, Bastion? Tracer mm -hmm. and eight others. Yeah. Um, and then they also they I think they came out and said that there was what over two hundred years was it of of playtime in the oh, weekend. Again, I, I mean, I, I know they got people that can crunch numbers. I know they have better computers than I get to play with, but yeah. good lord, that's a lot of data. Yeah, it's, it's and that was the purpose of the stress test was to give them that amount of data and, and you know that clearly there was something that they saw that I think when we have to scrap some things and rethink some things fundamentally, either from a hero perspective individually or from a map construction perspective, or perhaps certain mechanics aren't working the way that they want them to about how certain matches progress. It really is tough to see in a game that is still quite fun. You know, it's not like the game oh, yeah. is broken to the point where people are it, it's not like bat batman arkham um you know <laughs> from last year where folks were just like i give me my money back this is awful you know i don't think anyone had that impression i know that some folks kind of went oh i went and i played overwatch i don't feel this is a game for me i'm not gonna be a pvp arena shooter guy okay that's fine but nobody said this game is terrible and they should rework this whole thing i never heard that feedback so they clearly saw something in their data that made them concerned so they're they're taking a strong step here and, and disappointing a lot of content creators who were really kind of were banking on overwatch to be their bread and butter for a while no no let me ask you this before we move on from overwatch do you think that with with everything that we've kind of said and everything that we've danced around about the like, balancing and map flow and stuff like that do you think they're choice to rework it this drastically which i'm presuming it's a drastic rework for them to take it down um mm -hmm. do you think this is because they're wanting to push esports with it very hard right from the get oh yeah i mean i i, I think that it's I think that things were happening too fast. One of my beliefs are is I believe that P 
people were jumping on this game a bit too much uh, for a product that was not, I think, perhaps ready for quite the limelight that it received. Um, there are definitely, like I said, there's some problems with the game. And I think what was happening was they were beginning to see rumors of teams popping up and already talk of tournaments happening and, and all this happening very quickly. And I think that the difference between Overwatch in comparison to Heroes is Heroes had such a long beta process, such a long alpha process that it was going to be expected that people were going to start developing content. We're going to start developing teams. We're going to start trying to play this competitively while it was still in the testing phase. I don't know if they necessarily want that to happen for Overwatch as soon as it's going to happen. I think I want to control that a little bit more. Um, so they're going to they're gonna try and, I think, narrow the window down <clears throat> for how people get exposed to the game uh, and how they create that. And then it's interesting to see, do they want the esports scene to grow from launch? How does that work? Because in Heroes, you had an esports team that, scene that was very vibrant before you even launched the game, right? We had Heroes of the Dorm happen in April. Uh, Heroes of the Storm launched in late May. So you had this big, huge televised event that was all esports for a game that wasn't even out yet. Do they want that same kind of experience with Overwatch? I don't think that they quite do. Yeah. I, I, I can definitely agree with that. I think that, that they want an esport experience that is huge and massive for Overwatch. Don't get me wrong. Like, they want this to be CSGO for Blizzard. I, I totally think that that's what they want. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. They want this to be an eSport event. But do they want that in January of this year, February of this year? Probably not. I think they want this to start to happen in the summer and, and to slow the roll a little bit. Given, to what are they going to be able to handle structurally at Blizzard in terms of eSports with all the things that they're also trying to fire up at one time and trying to ramp up Heroes of the Storm in eSports, trying to ramp up already a juggernaut eSport in Hearthstone? You know, what are they going to do with StarCraft moving forward? They've got this whole new division with Activision and Blizzard, a whole new eSports division. That's got to fire up. Do you want to throw in trying to foster a game scene and Overwatch in the midst of all that? I don't know if they quite do. I know they want this to be launch ready for eSports, but I don't know how fast they want that to blossom. Mm. Mm. Follow up question from the chat room. Do you think that Overwatch can compete with StarCraft when it comes to esports? Yes, because I think the days of RTS, um, unfortunately, are over. Um, I think that most RTS players are moving into MOBA. Uh, I think that there's still going to be a long life for, for StarCraft, but are you going to see another RTS game have the same kind of longevity, the same type of passion that StarCraft has? No, that's not going to happen again. Uh, not until there's a major kind of just cultural cycle shift in gaming, which we'll see happen eventually, perhaps, where people want more long-form, complicated games with a lot of micromanagement. I think that most RTS players are starting to look at MOBA, League of Legends, Dota, and starting to go, well, that's a natural segue for me because it's closer to Twitch, and it's a better, and it's a very strong experience to watch esports. I still think MOBA is probably the strongest esports experience to watch. So I think that Overwatch could potentially be very big. Will it be bigger than StarCraft? That's hard to say because StarCraft, that's like saying, you know, it's kind of like saying, you know, is is uh, uh, is is, mixed, is MMA going to be bigger than uh, baseball in America? That's really hard to tell at this point because baseball has been so entrenched in our culture uh, as Americans that it's hard to say anything could overtake it. I think StarCraft is the same way. Now, will Overwatch and shooters be bigger? You know, that's it's whether or not the experience of how you watch it is as engaging as it is to watch an RTS. Um, like I said, I don't think we're going to see another RTS come to market and have the same dominance as StarCraft is. I think we're going to see folks gather toward, more towards Twitch-based gaming like MOBA, like first-person shooter. And that's what we're going to see moving forward. And then, of course, you know, your more strategic, thoughtful games like Hearthstone. You know, that could okay. start to be a resurgence in kind of uh, TCG, CCG games. That could be a thing as well. And, and you have to think, you, you touched on it there, but McRawley, you have to, you have to look at um, the fact that, like you said, StarCraft, we're kind of looking at StarCraft as a game in its twilight. It's, it, it's not, the, the sun is not setting, but it kind of is. It's not dark out, I guess. The sun is setting, but it's not dark yet. Um, Overwatch, the sun hasn't even started rising yet. So mm -hmm. to compare the it, it, night and day apples and oranges at the moment, baseball yeah. and MMA. Yeah, I mean, they're the, but it's it's an interesting comparison, you know, that he brings up because it's literally a game, as you said, Chris. It's really at the end of the line, yeah, in what it's going to be, unless that team decides 
let's figure out how we do, you know, StarCraft 3. I don't know if we're going to see that happen. Um, versus a game that could potentially be huge, but we don't know. I mean, people were saying how dominant Heroes was going to be while it was testing. Has Heroes taken that, you know, echelon away from Dota 2? No, it hasn't. Um, it's still got a long way to go because, once again, instead of being there first, you know, or StarCraft 2, StarCraft in and of itself, put Blizzard there first. Warcraft 3 put their Blizzard there first, right, in terms of competitive PvP matches for RTS. So they were there first on the scene, but they're not there. They're not first on the scene for any of these other games. Yeah. So that's that's a tough tough thing for them to do is to break into that and become dominant when you have people who have such brand loyalty already to a game. Well, it's going to be tough for them. Right on. Well, I think that about does it for Blizzard news for this week, guys. Now, like we said earlier, there's a lot of stuff out there for Legion Alpha. Um, one, I didn't want to touch the spoilers. Two, Mick doesn't have five and a half hours for us to run down all the stuff that's going on. <laughs> nor do I, or any of you in the chat room, I'm going to guess. If you guys mm -hmm. want to check that out, head to your favorite um, site. Go listen to a great show like The Starting Zone, where they'll dig into some of this stuff a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, go find your news uh, in some of those other places. But this week... Let's uh let's go ahead and dive into the uh the meat and the potatoes here. And now for the meat and potatoes. Okay, here we go. All right, so this week we're going to we're going to veer a bit away from a holy blizzard topic. Although this definitely involves Blizzard gaming for both of us. Um, Mick, to say that you're a prolific curator of content would be a complete and utter understatement. You host Super Heroic, mm -hmm. Stormcast, The Starting Zone, Dead Fans Talking. You have a YouTube series called The Spazbot Signal. And in the past, you've even created entire web series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you, to say that you have a couple irons in the fire right now, would, would that be an accurate statement? I, I think so. And, you know, there's always one or two in the fire of shows that are in development that, um, just haven't, you know, we haven't come to a point where we've decided, you know, let's move ahead and launch. We've got a show in the works for a while between myself and a technologist called, uh, a geek in the know that we've been working on for a while. And we're just kind of trying to figure out when that's going to come out and what's the right format for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have a lot of irons in the fire, but this has always been kind of typical for me historically, you know, throughout my career, uh, in the entertainment industry and now in new media. Um, it's something I've always wanted to be able to do, um, was to, to feel like I had a roster of shows and a, and a bank of shows and, and kind of when you, you, uh, when you, when you kind of get to a point where you kind of feel like you've created something that's had some success and then you can do it again, um, then you you kind of get to a point where like well can we do it again and what i've always tried to do too is to take the things that i'm interested in because i feel like when a content creator a podcaster or a blogger a youtuber they kind of tackle something they're really passionate about and create content around it that makes the difference and you know i have a lot of interest like a lot of folks who are in chat room today they all have uh, a lot of interest as well i think the difference between me and other folks is i tend to make shows about the things that i'm interested in as well as being interested in those things no, no. Let me ask you this. This, this is the question that I have. How did it start? How did how did Mick Montgomery get started doing his very first podcast? The very first podcast that I did was this. We did was the Starting Zone, which we fired up in two thousand and nine, um, and it it came out of more of an interest in at the time. I was working, or I have worked in the entertainment industry for a long time. So I work. I live in Los Angeles. I work in Hollywood. Uh, I worked in a number of different capacities in Los Angeles, either in front of the camera, behind the camera, way behind the camera. Um, and so for me, at the time, in that time frame, when YouTube was just starting to kind of become a thing, podcasting was a thing, but not a huge thing. All this stuff was really interesting to me. And I kind of thought that there was going to be an opportunity to make a career shift of some kind, but I needed to understand and know about it. Um, and at the same time, I just happened to start playing World of Warcraft. I went uh, into iTunes to see if there were any podcasts or anything about World of Warcraft on iTunes. And I found that there were these podcasts and I started to listen to them. And I started to talk with a friend of mine uh, who also worked in the entertainment industry, was a director and, 
and 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 worked in post production and, and we kind of said you know maybe we should try and do this you know we both can talk on a microphone you know we could podcast and so we fired up the starting zone uh, and at the time we had a lot of development conversations like okay well we can't just go out there and do the instance because somebody's already doing that so how do we make our show different and we said well at the time there really wasn't information or podcasts that were kind of trying to cater to the casual or, or newer player. And with Wrath being a very big gateway for a lot of folks to come into World of Warcraft, it was the right time to do content for the new player. So we started doing the show and instantaneously the downloads were kind of out of control in our minds, way above what we expected to have happen. Um, and so uh, we started to do the show. We were obviously building a guild at the same time. And so it was kind of all happening together. Uh, and that's how it was starting. And and I started off with a really crappy, you know, on my gaming headset and my laptop at my living room table, you know, recording a podcast. And Jesse handled much of the heavy listening, did all the posts, all the editing, all that kind of stuff, all the sound effects, all the bumpers. And eventually over time, as his interest kind of waned in podcasting, but my interests grew stronger, you know, that kind of role shifted. And then I took over more of the technical side and the writing of the show and and once I kind of made that decision that this was something I wanted to really pursue and really do well, um, really became the executive producer for the show. And Jesse took more of a backseat until the time in which his new job, you know, obviously became uh, a conflict of interest between what he was doing and we couldn't do that. We couldn't do the show together anymore. And so around that time, I had already started Spazbot Studios had already started Stormcast. And so we, we were kind of in this place where I was already moving in the direction of where I am now. It was just a matter of continuing on doing the work and just being a, a better craftsman at podcasting. That was probably the the biggest thing. So, but that's how I got into podcasting in the first place. Was just it was just an interesting thing to learn about. Did I anticipate that I would be doing that same show six years later? No, not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and there were many times where I thought we were going to throw in the towel. But for some reason, uh, the, the the listeners' feedback on a weekly basis. It's hard to say goodbye to folks that are writing and talking to you and, and, and the starting zone is a part of their life in some way, shape or form. And so it was hard to, to shut that down and say goodbye to that. Definitely. Definitely. Now I, I know even, even recently from, from listening to the starting zone, there was, there was some question or, or at least there were some gears turning in your head about whether or not the starting zone was going to fully continue. Was did I hear that right? Yeah, With yeah, there was definitely there was I I was having um, a thought in the midst of BlizzCon, and I don't think I was alone. By the way, uh, there were other podcasters also very concerned about what was going on with Legion. When the news came out that the game wasn't going to come out until the summer, we don't know what that means. That could be September of next year. That could be June, but that's a very long ways away. And and when you're trying to do a weekly show about World of Warcraft, it's really hard to do that when there's nothing to talk about within the world of Warcraft. Now, obviously, you could talk a lot about the beta and the alpha of Legion, and that's good stuff. But that's not, I think, the, where World of Warcraft content is the strongest. You're the strongest when you're playing the live game. And the, really, the game is the strongest when the new content is coming out. And so to think that you might go almost another year without new content, um, that was beginning to feel like this might be the end. Um, and then I began to think about how the conversation could change perhaps a little bit for the show and what that might look like. And, you know, we decided to, you know, obviously continue to keep moving forward with the show um, because I got excited again about what I was starting to hear about the the beta and Legion and, and Alpha and all that kind of stuff. So, but I, yeah, I think that when you've done a show for six years, it's really hard to continue to find the right motivation to do it. And the right motivation is the community of people that are listening to the show and, I don't think that people would, you know, pass out and die if the starting zone went away. But at the same time, um, there's not a reason yet that's real that strong to say to close the door. That makes sense. The reason to keep the door open was much, much more powerful than the reason to shut the door on the show. And that's kind of where, you know, I came to. And I've, I've lived with the show for a long time through many different reiterations and different hosts and you know, where it is today versus where it was a year ago is really two different, completely different places. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not like shows can't grow and change. It's just how long does that show continue to stay relevant? How long does World of Warcraft continue to stay relevant? These are all the questions that I was beginning to ask myself in lieu of also having the obligations to three other podcasts as well. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> so oh, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, wh- how does how does this show still continue to fit in? But I figured out how it continued to fit in and, and you move on. Well, well, if I may take just a second and fanboy out about it, I am very glad personally that the starting zone is going to continue on. It's it's one of the first podcasts that I ever listened to. I know I've shared this with you in the past, but even years before I was playing Warcraft, I was listening to the starting zone. I think it was. Yeah. And that the, stuff that boggles my mind that people would listen to. I have a friend who listens to the show and doesn't even play video games. <laughs> and I'm like, oh why are gosh. you, why are you listening to the show? You know, and, and that's tough, you know, and, and one of the things too that was hard for starting zone was I I have a belief for me personally, and for the shows that I produce that I wanted to to stay singularly driven on that particular game, for that particular show. Um, a lot of other shows have the opportunity to not do that, and I'm on one of those shows every about once a month. Um, there's a number of shows that have diversified in how they talk about Blizzard in a more universal standpoint on their shows, and I think that that's totally fine. Um, so the hard part too was, you know, do I go down the same road, uh, or how do I keep the specific to wow? And that's going to be a challenge for the show to continue to keep doing, but we're, we believe that that's something that we can continue to do. Um, uh, because I do know that there are people out there who wow is their central focus and they don't want to do anything else. They don't want to play other games. And so, um, to try and keep the conversation geared more towards this game and how it continues to evolve in the next six to seven months, um, is going to be a challenge, but at the same point, uh, we may find the end of that tunnel. Uh, we may not. I don't know yet. But um, the conversation is still continuing to happen. Right on. Now, now, let me ask you this. You you are on, so you do the starting zone and then three other podcasts. Yeah. So four podcasts in total. I, I can, just speaking from my experience, being doing the converted and doing this show. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of content creation and a lot of like time and thought and effort that goes into doing even an hour, or an hour and a half or two hour long show. Mm-hmm. How how do you balance out the time of of working and creating a show? And obviously, I, I know that you have a family as well. Sure, how does yeah. how does everything fit together for Mick and Spazbot? Um, well, you know, it's a great, really good question. And I, I get asked a lot um, this question in. Uh, we used to get this question all the time just when I was doing the starting zone. Like, how do you do a podcast and play WoW and have a family um, and have a job? I, I think for me, I have the benefit of working in an industry where it feels very culturally sane or normal. That you have this kind of, this is how I pay my bills job. And then you have this passion project or I also pay some of my bills with this job job that is more creatively driven. Um, There's a lot of people I know who are, you know, they have a job where they walk into a cubicle and they work on behalf of the the Hollywood gods, um, you know, from nine to five. And then they punch out and then they're trying to get their independent feature going or their web series going or their um, uh, their play written or whatever it happens to be Uh, and that they're doing that from seven to midnight. And that's what their passion is. And my passion has been content creation. And so. Um, I have very strict boundaries around when is this family time, when is this creation time, when is this work time. And I take advantage of technology in a lot of different ways to be able to produce what I produce. I'm a big believer in templatization of production workflows. It's what I specialized in in my day job. How do we templatize what we're doing so that it remains successful and consistent and we can continue to keep doing that? So once you get the workflow down, once you get your template for how you produce down, then it's just simply a matter of replicating that over and over again, yet still injecting interesting stuff into the mix of that. And most of my shows, but people would notice, are talk show driven. They're sit down, get in front of a microphone, have a conversation about a topic. And that's not that hard to produce, in my opinion. Uh, it's hard to produce well, so maybe there's a performance part of that that is challenging that some people maybe can't do. But I come from a strong performance background, so it was easier for me to slip into um, and the rest of it was just organization and staying on top of it. And yeah, there are definitely days where I look at it and go, my God, I'm going to do six podcasts this week and a guest spot over here. What am I doing? But right now, I believe that what we're building with SpazBot is a community of content creators. Um, it's not just me. It's the other hosts on the show. It's the other folks that are contributors to our show, like you're a contributor to the Starting Zone. Um, we have people that are contributors to Super Heroic. 
Um, you know, I have two hosts at Dead Fans Talking that are completely devoid of video game content and have no place in the Blizzard gamer community at all. Um, and then, of course, I have Alt with Starting Zone, and then I have Dills and and uh, and I have Notch for for Stormcast. So I have this great group of people that I work with too that help keep you motivated to keep going. If I was on my own trying to do solo podcasting, and I've done that, it just wouldn't work for me. But because I feel like I'm on a team with people. That's what continues to keep me motivated. And then the rest was just making and building the structure and being able to manage your time wisely. Right on. Now, let me ask you a little bit, a little bit different question. Sure. You've been doing this for quite some time. You're, mm-hmm. I, I think everyone in the chat room would agree that you are wildly successful at what you do. And the, the definition for that might be, Totally different for different people, but everything sure. that you do is wonderful. Um, it's well produced, it's well put together, and and even even if you don't like, I'm not a huge uh, I'm not a huge Walking Dead fan, but I listen to Dead fans talking. Um, <laughs> weird, I know. But what would you say to the person that's that's listening to this, and maybe they're thinking about starting a podcast? Sure. Mm-hmm. What 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 do you say to that person? It's tar- it's tough to give them one thing. I can give them several things, but uh, it's so because it's really hard to say. Well, here's the one wisdom point that you should have. <laughs> um, I think the the first thing I would say is that make sure that you're really passionate about the topic. Like, it's a topic that is something that has been a part of your life for a long time, and that you find yourself talking about it frequently you you pursue content about it already um you read blogs you have youtubers that you subscribe to whatever it might be that's really important if you're not passionate like really passionate about what it is that you're talking about and also the community around that topic then you're not going to sustain a show so don't start like make sure that you know like I know that I want to do this for a year or two years, especially if you're talking about a podcast, which can take you months and months and months and maybe even a year of time before you feel like you've cracked through and are becoming a part of the the conversation at large around your topic and your niche and your subject. Um, Make sure that not just you are passionate about the subject, but make sure there's a community around the subject. That's also important. You know, it's one of the rules I have at SpazBody is, is there a story there? Yes. Great. Is there a community there that wants to hear that story? Yes. Okay, great. And if those things are in place, then it's good. World of Warcraft's a great example of being able to create content about a really great community. That's actually what this is about. It's not really about a game. It's really the story is the players that play the game and how they react to how the game changes and ebbs and flows. That's the actual story, right? So, that means that there's a conversation, a story, and a discourse to have in and around that stuff. So it makes it an easy topic to go, yes, World of Warcraft. So then the last thing is, how will your voice be different than all the other people that are already having a conversation through Medium about that topic? And that's important, too. If you come to the table and you say, well, I'm going to do a World of Warcraft news show. I'm sorry, but there are 30 shows that do that right now. Almost every show does that right now. That's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. It doesn't matter how and it doesn't matter how good you are, how solid you are. What is it now? Is it going to be your approach? Are you going to be like a NS, NS, NSFW show? That could maybe be something. There is actually already a show out there doing that though. So you know how are you going to be different? How are you going to be specific in your niche? Is it going to be your personality with your co-hosts? Is that going to be it? The chemistry between you that might work. But there are a lot of shows out there that have great chemistry that aren't necessarily getting heard as much as they maybe should because they haven't figured out a way to establish an identity for themselves. So once you kind of peg your niche, then you're going to be able to figure out what you're going to do and move forward. All the shows that I do, I feel like we have kind of we try to strive to have a niche. And if we can get into a groove with that niche and begin to build a community behind it, uh, then it's important. And then we become a part of the bigger conversation around that stuff. And, and, you know, that's challenging. You know, there are walking dead podcasts that have 20 to 50,000 downloads is dead fans talking there. Good God. No, (laughs) you know, that show doesn't have nearly that many, uh, that many downloads. Is it a better show than some of those shows? Unfortunately it is, 
but it was about figuring out how to build a community. And up front, that was one of the things I learned about launching Dead Fans was we didn't do a good enough job building a community around the show. We didn't start really building a community around the show, I think, until the summer. And that's when we started to see our numbers go up for that show. So that's the other, the kind of three important things. Is there a story? Are you passionate about that story? Do you have a community around that topic? Yes, great. What is going to be your unique point of view about it? And if you can answer all those questions, you've got a show. Wow. That, I, was, I was expecting like a one-point answer. That was incredible. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of in awe. That, wow. So now with, with the amount of shows that you already have, with all the stuff that you have going on, you said that you have some other projects in the works. Mm -hmm. How, and you kind of already answered this in the last question, but how does it come about that a new show appears? Like, is it, is it a conversation? You become passionate about something. You have a conversation. Yeah. How, how does that process, like, how did, how did super heroic come about? Cause that's, that's one of the new shows. That's one of the shows I'm excited about. Yeah. Like, um, super heroic came about, um, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I would say that super heroic was created probably from the best places of all. Right. So I've been a comic book collector for a long time, you know, all the way back to when I was a little kid. And so, I wanted to do something about comic books. I wanted to, I wanted to do a show about comic books. I'm like, man, there's so many, there's so many podcasts out there that are just like, what comic books came out this week, guys? Oh, great. Captain America, number bleep, bleep, bleep. You know, and I, I thought to myself, well, God, I don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> and then I kind of, I, so it really took me a long time. Like a, doing a comic book oriented show was something in my mind for over two, three years. Like this, this had been gestating for a long time. Now you could argue like, well, Walking Dead's kind of a comic book show. I'm like, mm, it's not, it's a television show podcast, but we sometimes talk about the comic book. So when we went to Super Heroic, we went through a long time. We just kind of figure out, well, how am I going to come, come up with a niche that's going to work? And then at the time I was, I was meeting with Pat Crane and Jewel Scott on a regular basis about, you know, just, just meeting every once in a while and talking like, how's your podcasting life going? Mine, mine's going crappy. How about yours? Mine's crappy too. Great. You know, or this week has been awesome and here's why. And I said, you know, I think I figured out a show in which I could do, get into the comic book space, but I can do it uniquely by talking about comic book movies and TV shows. Like there are so many comic book TV shows now. There's so many comic book movies coming out. They're going to be coming out for a long time. And there's a lot of people who are paying money to see these things. There seems to be popular. Maybe there's something there. And as we kind of bandied around the idea a little bit, they said, yeah, that sounds like a niche. And then I went, okay, there's the good. And I knew there was already culture and a community of people because if there wasn't, then why does Screen Rant and Cinema Blend and all these other websites, why are they successful? Uh, because people like to talk about comic books. And they like to talk about these comic book movies, especially right now and TV shows. So that's kind of how it went. It was like, hey, there's a community there. Um, there's a lot of story. There's a lot of discussion. I mean, you know, last night, the Batman versus Superman newest trailer comes out. And my Slack and my Twitter are ablaze with opinions about how bad or good that trailer is. It's clearly a sign that there's a, there's a story to be told in small and in big ways. And that's what we continue to keep trying to do in Super Heroic. And at the very end, we still talk about just, you know, went to the comic book store and I bought this book this week. And that's still part of what we do on the show. So that was kind of how the show came about. It was, it was, it sat in the back of my mind for a long, long time. And then the right opportunity came about. And I think also too, by the time that I got to June of this last year, of this year of 2015, I felt like I had the structure to support another show. And we tried something different with the starting zone where we brought Alt on as a co-host. And then we also brought on a bunch of other guys, yourself included, but Chris Allman and Tyler Rivers and Jason Lucas and Spencer, Spencer Downey. So it brought on a bunch of these guys already. And we kind of had this experiment of, you know, bringing people in and out of the show. And I said, well, what if I did something where I was the kind of regular host and there was nothing but that, like everyone was just coming in and out. There was just me and all these different guys and gals. And uh, so we tried that and so far it has worked um, and it's been really cool to see that group of people, you know, work together and form a relationship too about this content and talking about it. And that's one of the best things about doing these shows is even though none of us are paying our mortgage right now by doing these shows, what we're getting out of it is community and encouragement and being able to be creatively expressive. And that has a value point that's really important. Right on. Now, now, we touched on, 
kind of how you came around to the shows, what you would say to a new podcaster, what would you say to that podcaster that's out there that's that's plugging along, that's maybe 70, 100 episodes in, still loving it, still enjoying it, still having fun, but what can they do, what can they do to kind of take things to that next level? Well, could you give me an example of what next level means? So you have a podcast, you're at 70 episodes, you're at 100 episodes, you're, mm-hmm. you've upgraded some equipment, you're doing all right, you're, you're at, I, I don't know, you're at 100 downloads a week. You want to okay. step right. up. So you're below the average then. Yeah, or you're okay. at the average, or you just want to you, you move forward. What, it, what do you do when things start slowing down or things maybe like th- this time in the game? Some people are walking away um, to speak specifically to what, uh, World of Warcraft. People are walking away, content slowing down, content's mm-hmm. picking right back up with alpha. Yeah, um, yeah. But wh- what does somebody do at that point? Um, that's a, a good question. And it's so it's a really personal thing. Um, I think if you're trying to grow your podcast, the best way to grow your podcast, the number one thing to do when it, as it relates to new media in general, this is a this is a rule that doesn't apply to podcasting. It applies to blogging. It applies to YouTube. It applies to all of these avenues for creating content and getting it out to people. And the most important thing that anyone can do, and I know this to be true because I've done it myself, you have got to collaborate with other content creators in your topic. You have to do that, hands down. That means having people on as guests. That means getting on their shows. That means maybe coming up with a collaborative project to work on together. If it's specific to podcasting, that means 100%. Hey, I like your show. Your show is great. We'd love to have you on our show. Great former relationship. Maybe you go on their show. Maybe you come up with something very structured, like maybe do a two-parter where you do you know, the first part on your show and then do the second part on their show. I don't know what that necessarily looks like, but you've got to collaborate with other community members out there. The, the fact that I, I appear on two to three different podcasts sometimes a week besides the ones that I do is because I believe strongly in collaborating. Now, if that show, it doesn't matter to me if that show has as many downloads as my show or more downloads as my show, it's important for me to create relationships with other content creators. That's it. And then the other stuff just happens, right? So that's the number one thing to make your show grow. You can talk about like, I'm going to institute using Tweepy more on my Twitter account and grow my Twitter following and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Those things all kind of work, but at the end, you have to understand you got to be a part of a community. Like if you look at the, the strength and growth of the maker content creator community, whether you're a woodworker, a metal worker, or an electronist or a machinist, and all the YouTubers and podcasters in that space that are creating it, and it's exploding right now, you know, millions and millions and millions of views, millions and millions of podcast downloads, tons of money and sponsorship being thrown out to some of these YouTubers are making it. Why? Because they are a strong core group of content creators that have banded together and welcome new people into the fold. As long as you've got a good show, you're welcome into the fold. Let's do something together. And that's the beauty and the strength of new media as opposed to traditional media where I come from, where everyone's segregated and everyone has to own something and no one can work together and everybody has to have their own little part of the pie. And in new media, that, that idea goes away because the more that we kind of create together, the more content we create in general, the more people get exposed to it, the more passionate they become, the more successful everybody is. So collaboration is the number one thing that folks can do to grow their podcast. It's not necessarily about new microphones, although that helps. Getting a new mixer, that helps. Getting a great hosting service, that all helps. That's all good. It makes your show feel more professional. But at the same time, the collaboration is actually, I think, where you're going to experience more growth than anything else. Right on. Right on. And I, I definitely, with that, I appreciate you coming over and, and spending some time here on the game case. Um, it, it, it's always great to have somebody else from the community, but especially somebody, it's, it's somebody that has really had such an effect on my own podcasting um, as yourself. Like, I, I, I really and truly appreciate you being here. And, and with that, um, that's going to bring us to uh, time for shout outs. Sweet. And now it's time for shout outs. All right, yeah, come on. Whoa, I mean, not come on, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so Mick, you got any shout outs for us this week? 
I might might seem a little schmarmy, but I do want to give a shout out to all the other Spazbots over at Spazbot Studio. Um, we're currently working really hard on a holiday show, which is the first time we've ever done this. Um, when I was doing live theater way back in the day, I always wanted, I, we always did holiday shows in any theater company I worked with or did stuff with. We always did a holiday show. Um, and I wanted to do one with Spazbot last year, but it just didn't happen. And this year I was like, let's do it together. So we just actually announced it today on December 12th, uh, at 7 30 PM Pacific standard time over at our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Spazbot studios. We're going to be doing a holiday show where all the people from all the shows, Cuddles is going to be on the show. We're all going to get together. You know, all four shows are going to kind of do segments and we're going to have a little bit of a holiday show and give some prizes away. So everybody's been really great in terms of coming together to help me work on that. So I just want to give everyone, you know, at Spazbots, you know, all the guys and gals, just a big shout out for coming together on that project. It's been fun so far and, and we're not quite to a point where we're done and ready with the show. We're going to get there this week, but um, yeah, it's been an exciting process to, to finish the year off with this kind of collaborative project. Right on. And I, I, I know I am super excited about that. It's going to be so like just the idea of getting all of these people, like yeah. all these, all these I cool still, people together. I don't know how it's going to work uh, <laughs> technology wise. We're going to figure it out, you know, I think as we go, <laughs> uh, it's going to be really exciting to, you know, get to be able to sit down and, and, you know, as many folks as we have on the roster that are going to be showing up, uh, yeah, it's just crazy to think that, you know, 14 or 15 or 16 of us, I don't know how many hosts that we have involved now. Um, we have a lot, uh, you know, that are going to be there as well as how many folks I know who are just going to tune in. And, you know, we've got some great prizes to give away. Gunner Optics has given away some glasses and Jinx has given away this big prize bundle. And Tyler Rivers, who's one of our contributors, who's done a lot of artwork for me, did the super heroic uh, logo. He's got this, he sent it to me today, this custom Goldan Grinch painting digital painting he did that is just awe-inspiring that we're going to be giving away that too so just a lot of cool stuff that's happening and, and it's it's going to be a lot of fun right on right on well i can't even follow that up other than big shout out um to my wife big shout out to the cuddle wife for all of her support and allowing me to do what it is that i do um, and of course, like big shout out to, to Mick. Um, I already kind of touched on it, but thank you for coming and spending some time with me. I, I really and truly appreciate it, sir. I cannot wait to see all the great things that are coming out of Spazbot that, uh, we have, a, we have a little, tw or uh, I almost said Twitch. We have a Slack that like everybody is in for, for Spazbot to and seeing the stuff that, that comes out of there and some of the ideas and the collaboration mm -hmm. it's you, you have gotten together a uniquely wonderful group of individuals. And I, I can't wait to see what comes out of all these folks. Yeah. I'm really, I feel really lucky and I don't know how much of it is me and how much is it all is, is them. You know, I, I just feel like I kind of said, here's a space to talk and, what I've loved to see now is that other folks who are doing podcasts of their own are being able to secure guests and collaborate together more. So I feel like our Spazbot Slack is kind of a, a vehicle for that. And and I really appreciate that that's kind of happened organically in and around me. And I, and I do have to say to everyone who's listening, you guys don't understand how rare it is for a guy like Chris to, to happen and to exist and to come into your community of content creators with a show like this with an, an intention and a, and a mind and an insight to what is really going on um, within the world of the community of World of Warcraft, Blizzard Gaming, all that good stuff. You know, Chris has really come in here with an amazing amount of passion and an amazing amount of energy, which is actually really rare. You know, I see a lot of folks come in with, with Chris's enthusiasm, but like I always see that person with that much enthusiasm fizzle out after a month. And Chris has continued to work and, and, and work hard and build and form uh, his own community and his own base of people who follow and support him. And I can say, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, when Chris comes on one of my shows, I get more downloads when he comes on my show. Uh, you know, that is a real thing. So I think, you know, you've been very kind to me on this episode, but I think you need to pat yourself on the back because here we are coming into the twilight of 2015 and you've built a lot for yourself this year. And I think a lot that you can really be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Just thank you, Mick. That, uh, You're very welcome. That, that means an incredible amount coming from you, sir. Well, you know what? You deserve every bit of it. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things on the horizon for all of us. We just need to continue to keep making the content and, 
Uh, we got good folks, you know, that show up in our chat channels and download the shows every week. And, you know, and there's also those unspoken people that never chime in, that never tweet you, that never email you, but support you every week by downloading and listening. And it's about those folks as well. Definitely. Definitely. And that's that's going to bring it to the, us to the part of the show where I beg for those all important iTunes reviews. So, guys, if you're listening and downloading me over on iTunes or Stitcher, Stitcher, give me the thumbs up. Give me the stars. On iTunes, I would like a five-star review, guys. If you want to give me five stars, remember this is the Game Case Show. If you don't like the show, remember to give us two stars for the Don't Baste Me Bro. It's a podcast by a disgruntled turkey that doesn't appreciate the holiday season. Two stars for Don't Baste Me Bro. Now, Mick, <laughs> where can people find you on the internet? Um, uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> what's the spiel? Where can my wife people is, find my you wife is looking internet? at me, rolling her eyes, like, "What's your elevator pitch, Mick?" Um, <laughs> so here are the shows. Uh, Stormcast Show is a Heroes of the Storm podcast. If you like Heroes of the Storm, you can check that out at stormcastshow.com. Uh, we do that show every single week. Uh, the Starting Zone is a World of Warcraft podcast for new and experienced players. If you want to check that show out, go on over to thestartingzone.com. That's where you can find it. There, uh, Dead Fans Talking is, of course, a Walking Dead fan cast. Whether you're a fan of The Walking Dead or you're a fan of Three Goofballs. That is a good show for you as well. Uh, two of my co-hosts are well-known actors and stand-up comedians, so they're really smart and really fun and a lot of good times we have on that show. Check that out at deadfanstalking.com. And then last but certainly not, not least, the newest show in the Spazbot family, Super Heroic. Uh, that is a show about comic books and TV shows, uh, which you can find at superheroicshow.com. All of those podcasts are, of course, available on iTunes and on Stitcher. And if all that is way too much for you to write down and remember... Just remember, spazbotstudios.com. That's where you can go and find all the shows that we're working on and all the links therein. Right on. And that will do it for episode 34. If you'd like to join us, just like some of these amazing, wonderful folks have in the chat room, Erlina, BMW, Chief Vulgin, Draven, Hexy, Kaz, Killa, McRawley, my wife, Smug Sauce, uh, Superior Brandon Swayze and the inestimable Zug. You can join us here each and every Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash the game case. Thank you so much for listening to episode 34. You can find me on Twitter at mullet863. You can find the show at the game case show. You can download us on iTunes and Stitcher. You can catch recordings of the live show or our tips, tricks, and kill videos at youtube.com slash the game case, where you can find all of the things on the official site of the game case show, thegamecase.com. Mick, thanks again, sir. Say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> game case out. Thank you for joining us this week inside the Game Case. Please join us next week for more news, tips, and ramblings about the world of Warcraft. Game Case out. World of the Warcraft.